I know I've said some harsh things, but this weapon's actually really fun to use. It's just outclassed and ineffective a lot of the time. C tier. Here we are at the finale, the moment you've all been patiently waiting for. I'm getting teary-eyed just thinking about it. It's finally time to reveal the worst weapon, so stay tuned. Now, let's go through the rules one last time, for old times sake. And by old times, I mean like a, like a month ago, is that what this is? Rule 1, random crits will not be taken into consideration. Rule 2, I will be rating them based on their use in 12v12. 3, multi-class weapons have to be bad on all classes they can be equipped by. And 4, MVM will not be taken into account. And with all that said, here we go for the final time. I can do it quick, hey, okay? What? <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> I've mentioned in a previous episode that I think it's a shame most of the laser weapons are disappointing because I think they look really cool, and the Man Melter is no different. From the base up, the Man Melter was designed to be a side piece for the Flog because the fire damage it deals helps charge oomph, and since the Flog can't air blast, the Man Melter's extinguishing ability helps make up for it. However, over time, the Scorch Shot has proven to be a better companion for the Flog since, you know, it's the Scorch Shot. So what is the Man Melter even good for if it's outclassed at being a flog side piece? Well, the Man Melter gains crits for every ally you extinguish, so if the enemy pyro is really good at setting your friendlies on fire, or spams their flare guns, you can farm an incredible amount of crits in a very short amount of time. Combine all those crits with the increased projectile speed, the Man Melter can become a long-range crit-boosted sniper. And the great thing about it is that unlike the flare gun, you only need to hit one of these shots to be dealing that crit damage. This is why, instead of the flog, I think that the Man Melter's best pair is the backburner. Because of the increased air blast ammo cost, it means that you can extinguish all your teammates while still getting to keep your ammo for air blasting spam and projectiles when it matters. However, that ideal situation is pretty rare. Like, what if the enemy team doesn't have a pyro, or what if they're not even good and die before they can set your teammates on fire? And what if they're running the shotgun and not spamming flares? The biggest flaw is that the Man Melter's effectiveness isn't in your control, it's in the enemy's. And not being in control of the effectiveness of your own toolkit does not make for a good weapon. But when you do get that spam happy pyro and farm infinite crits, the Man Melter is pretty much the best flare gun. It's kinda weird really. The Man Melter goes in C tier, which stands for situational. <laughs> This one feels personal. Flashback to a simpler time, when the Jungle Inferno update was first being announced. I was absolutely mesmerized by the hot hand. It looked like it was going to be the funniest weapon ever. And when the update dropped, I began the long journey of farming those Pyroland contracts so I could earn the funny slap meme weapon. And after all my hard work, I got it. But then I began to use the hot hand and I felt the disappointment sink in. The hot hand doesn't sound so bad on paper. A speed boost on hit in exchange for a slight damage penalty would give you a mobility boost or escape tool, but make your melee a less reliable combat tool. But the hot hand has the worst hidden stat in the game. The hot hand's damage is split between two hits. This means that instead of doing 52 damage per swing like the description implies, you actually deal 28 per swing, which, yes, means it deals less damage than the stock bat. Words cannot describe how atrocious this is. The stock axe is bad enough on its own. Now imagine that, but it deals less than half of its base damage. That's the hot hand. And if you thought the hot hand's speed boost could be helpful as an escape tool or maybe a combo tool where you slap the enemy and pull your primary out for speed, no. The speed boost lasts exactly one second. This means the only thing you have time for to make use of the speed boost is to just go for another slap. 
a slap that deals 28 damage. On top of that, the Hot Hand has a slower firing speed compared to the Stock Axe. It deals 28 damage, offers a counterintuitive upside, and it swings slower. The Hot Hand is S tier. There's like no room for debate on this. Even though the needle guns have some differences, they share the same basic DNA, so I'm just gonna lump them all together in one segment. The main problem that all the needle guns have is that they're not the crossbow. I know everyone and their mom has said that, but think about it. The crossbow fires a single, fast-traveling projectile that is capable of massive amounts of both healing and damage, with the max damage you can deal being 75, which is pretty respectable for the medic. It's a reliable self-defense weapon, and a huge utility to your team. The needle gun's projectile speeds are less than half of that of the crossbow. They have spread, which makes them less reliable, and unlike the crossbow, offer no help to your team outside of defending yourself. They're also really hard to aim. Not to mention they don't make those amazingly satisfying noises the crossbow makes. Mm. This doesn't mean that the needle guns are useless, in a world where the crossbow was never added to the game, they'd still be fine for their intended use, self-defense and preservation. But it's hard to justify using a needle gun these days. And with that said, let's talk about each needle gun, separately. The syringe gun is the clear loser out of all of Medic's primaries. It doesn't offer anything except the ability to just, uh, shoot needles. It suffers all the problems the others do, the weird projectiles that require both insane tracking and prediction to deal a substantial amount of damage, and the inability to heal teammates. And with no upsides that double down on self-preservation, the syringe gun is just an awkward and janky downgrade to its peers. The Blutsauger is a bit of an improvement over the syringe gun's design. As a weapon, the two are nearly identical, but the Blutsauger has two stats that make it differ from the syringe gun. The first is that you gain 3 health per needle you land. And considering the fact there's 40 syringes in a clip, that's a potential 120 health per clip. This means that if your team sucks at defending you, and always leaves you behind, you can just say screw them and become a health regenerating menace to the enemy team. The projectiles are still whack, but with a mixture of luck and practice, the amount of damage you can deal and health you can gain can make you survive situations you really shouldn't be able to as the medic. However, if you do have a competent team that protects you and sticks with you, the downside is really gonna hurt you. Two less regen per second really slows down how much health you gain over time. So if you're at low health and need to recover, you either need to hope people miss their shots, or disconnect your medibeam to try and fire a couple needles at the enemy. This is not a gamble you need to make with the other needle guns. So if you have a competent team, I'd avoid using the Blutsauger. And the Overdose is the syringe gun for someone who doesn't want to use the crossbow, but doesn't feel like committing to the Blutsauger. The Overdose offers a speed boost that builds alongside your uber charge level that caps at 20% when your uber reaches 100. This is not a passive speed boost and requires you to hold the weapon out. Now this means that you're not going to be able to get that speed when you have your medigun out, which you arguably need it more for, but the overdose makes for a great escape tool at higher percents, letting you get the hell out of dodge if things go south. The great thing about this is that unlike other weapons with speed bonuses like the power jack, Gru, and escape plan, the overdose has no penalty for holding it out, meaning whipping the thing out and running like a madman has no downside. Speaking of downsides, the Overdose might as well not even have one. Yeah, a 15% damage penalty would be a worthwhile penalty on a weapon that deals higher amounts of damage, but the Overdose deals one less damage than the syringe gun's base 10, which means the downside is kinda laughable. The Overdose is probably the most viable unlock other than the crossbow, and using it is incredibly fun and a nice change of pace compared to the syringe gun. But the crossbow still remains the undisputed king of medic primaries. So it's not quite meta, but it's the next best thing. It's fun. The syringe gun goes in B tier, the Blutsauger goes in C tier, and the overdose lands itself in the E tier. I'd like to apologize in advance for this segment. 
because truth be told, the Neon Annihilator and Homewrecker are my two least used weapons in the game, period, despite Pyro being my most played class. This is due to me thinking that Pyro is mind-numbingly boring to play. But I do acknowledge that despite it not being my cup of tea, the Home Wrecker is not a bad weapon, and thus, not on this list. The Neon Annihilator is not so lucky, though. The problem is that it's just a worse Home Wrecker with what has to be the most situational stat in the game. The Neon Annihilator crits wet players. This is supposed to make up for Pyro's lack of underwater combat, but if you're dead set on being a Pyro in the water for some reason, the shotguns all do a fine job and still leave you with reliable melee options. That's not to say the Neon Annihilator doesn't have its uses. The Neon Annihilator is probably Pyro's best weapon on one map. Two for it. One-shotting medics and light classes turning a sharp corner before they can even react is no joke. The problem is 2 Fort is not the only map in the game, and I can count the other maps with water on like one hand. Now the crits also apply to Jurati and Mad Milk, which is a thing I guess. But seeing an enemy coated in milk in Jurati is kind of a rare sight for Pyro. And strangely enough, the throwable item for Pyro that coats an enemy in liquid doesn't count for crits. Like why? I would use both these items if that one little thing got changed. There is so much meme potential being wasted here. Another upside is the fact that it can destroy a sapper with two hits compared to the home wreckers one. But the Neon Annihilator does have the higher damage against players, so maybe you could use it like a more offensive home wrecker. But I'm not sure how much of a difference the three damage makes in a fight. So unless you're playing two for it and maybe Banana Bay, stay far far away from the Neon Annihilator. A tier. The Liberty Launcher is intended to be a jack-of-all-trades type of weapon. You get increased projectile speed like the direct hit, good. You get one more rocket in your clip, sort of like the airstrike, nice. And to top it all off, you have a reduction in blast damage taken, which means you can rocket jump more without even needing to bring the gunboats. Fantastic! But the problem is that 25% damage penalty. This brings you down from the rocket launcher's base damage of 90 all the way down to 68, which is 3 measly points from doing the same damage as the shovel. This damage penalty can really burn you when fighting higher health classes like Soldier and Heavy. Your splash damage does about as much damage as tickling your enemy, and killing a heavy without overhill can take all of the rockets in your clip. However, the Liberty Launcher tends to fare pretty well against lighter classes like Scout and Medic. You can still two-shot these classes with direct hits, and with the increased projectile speed, that's much easier to pull off. The direct hit is better at hitting directs for sure, but in combination with the other upsides, the Liberty Launcher can still hold its own in a fight. Another cool thing about the projectile speed increase is that it can throw off the Pyro's muscle memory for reflecting, due to them expecting a slower rocket to reflect. It's still kinda dumb to spam projectiles at an air blast happy Pyro, but you are a bit more safe than you otherwise would have been. I should also mention that the bonus rocket in your clip is a huge bonus. And unlike the airstrike, you get access to it right off the bat instead of needing to get a kill first. If you combine the Liberty Launcher with a shotgun, you have a lot more sustain for your firearms in a fight. When I use the Liberty Launcher though, I use a single loadout and I never deviate from it. The Liberty Launcher, Man Treads, and Market Gardener is an absolute blast to play with. These weapons all synergize so well. My main gripe with the man treads has always been the amount of damage you take from rocket jumping. But thanks to that blast damage reduction from the Liberty Launcher, rocket jumping to go for a garden is a lot less risky and a lot more rewarding. The amount of mobility you have in the air is astounding, and you are more precise in the air thanks to the man treads and the extra rocket in the Liberty Launcher's clip. And you still always have the Liberty Launcher's rockets to fall back on in case you need a ranged weapon. However, for this strat to really work, you're going to want to play on maps with a lot of open space for rocket jumping, like High Tower and Harvest. Although the Liberty Launcher is a bit outclassed by other launchers, it still has its uses. I'm going to put it in the C tier. I only really wanted to cover a few stock melees, but they're all kind of the same, so I'll just cover all of them. Also, remember that rule about multi-class weapons needing to be bad on all classes? Well, all the melees have different names and models and stuff, so I don't even know if it applies to my own rule, 
So, whatever, I'll, I'll just cover them all. First things first, Spy and Ninji stock melees are exempt from this list because they function very differently than the other classes' melees. With that said, the Demo and Sniper get the most use out of their melees. Most of Demo's melees are swords, so if you're just playing vanilla Demo Man, your options are pretty much the Pain Train, Caber, and Bottle. The Bottle, more often than not, is gonna be your best choice, so F tier. Sniper's Kukri is also a solid option if you're not using the Bushwhacka, and are instead using the Backpacks or an SMG. Due to Sniper's other melees being trash and a pretty okay side gear aid, respectively. F tier. Scout has a lot of good melee options, but what if you need is a reliable damage dealing weapon, and you always kill yourself with the Basher? I guess the Bat is an inoffensive option. C tier. The Fists are just a bad option. The KGB do the punching job better, and there's the other melees that provide a lot better utility. And that's not even mentioning heavy speed making closing the gap for a melee kill impossible. A tier. The Shovel is just a worse Market Gardener. The Market Gardener can reliably crit, is more fun to use, and all it does is swing a little slower. The Shovel goes in A tier. Bonesaw is just a worse Uber Saw, and a sophisticated medic always uses this solemn vow. So no head? Never use the Bone Saw, A tier. Pyro's Axe is a literal downgrade from the third degree. Literally no reason to just not use that if you really insist on using a stock melee for Pyro. A tier. Okay, that should be all of them. Now on to the rest of the list. These two weapons aren't even intended for serious use. It even says so in the description itself. All these are used for is practicing jumps. But just because a weapon isn't intended to be good, doesn't exclude it from the list. Let's start with the Rocket Jumper. Obviously taking away your primary source of damage is a huge downside. But I would be lying if I said that the mobility the Rocket Jumper gives is seriously impressive. Look at how far you can go without taking a single digit of damage. The only real useful weapon to pair with the Rocket Jumper is the Market Gardener. A weapon that lets you rocket jump for free mixed with a weapon that rewards you with rocket jumping. It's a true match made in heaven. However, you still are sacrificing your main source of damage, so it'll never be viable in a serious scenario. Yet this stupid joke weapon is still somehow better than the other weapons in S tier, so I gotta go ahead and put the rocket jumper in A tier. The sticky jumper is a different story though. See, unlike Soldier, Demo has two primary weapons. So exchanging one of them for a massive mobility boost can actually be a better trade-off. And when I say massive mobility boost, I mean massive mobility boost. You can basically fly on demand with this sticky jumper, which means it's great for approaching, escaping, closing the distance, all at very little risk to yourself. However, the absolute power of the sticky bomb launcher is hard to give up, and the sticky jumper drastically reduces your damage as a whole. So I can't quite say it's a good weapon, so the Sticky Jumper goes in C tier. From a design standpoint, the lock and load is an abomination. Two barrels, but it holds three pipes. You load all the grenades into the bottom barrel, yet they shoot out of the top barrel. Thinking about it way too long will, will melt your brain. But how does the lock and load perform in combat? Meh. The lock and load has two upsides, a faster traveling projectile, and a 20% damage bonus to buildings. The faster projectile can be nice for hitting further away enemies more consistently, and hitting air shots with the lock and load is leagues easier than it is with its peers. But if you're already a god at aiming pipes, this stat is not going to do anything for you but throw your muscle memory off. Lucky for me, I absolutely suck at Demo Man. I mean, look at the description I use for the lock and load, I think it speaks for itself. The increase in damage to buildings also puts you over a pretty important damage threshold. You can now destroy any of Engineer's buildings with two shots. This means you can take down a sentry even faster than the direct hit can. Combining the lock and load with a sticky bomb launcher of your choice makes you an absolute menace to the enemy Engineer. The best stat of the lock and load isn't even in the description, oddly enough. 
Due to the faster projectile speed and lack of wind resistance on your pipes, the range of your primary is much longer compared to your other options. There is nothing more satisfying than out-sniping a sniper with the lock and load. Unfortunately, the downsides of the lock and load can be pretty overwhelming and make it hard to justify using it. The first of which is a clip penalty, which reduces your launcher from the base 4 ammo to 3 ammo. This cuts your potential damage in a clip way down and makes sustaining longer fights harder due to having to reload more often. On top of that, the lock and load also has a smaller blast radius, which means you're less effective against groups of enemies, limiting your pure spam capabilities. And finally, you don't get rollers. Now rollers are huge for Devilman. Missing a pipe isn't too punishing, because the roller sets an area where the enemy can't go unless they want to take damage. This gives you more control over the enemy and makes their moves more predictable. With the lock and load, you don't get that control, so when using it you have to make every shot count. And even the best demo players miss their shots sometimes. The lock and load is an interesting and fun weapon, but the downsides are overwhelming compared to the upsides. However, it's still a consistent and reliable source of big amounts of damage. So I think that the D tier is a good middle ground. The base jumper is not a weapon you see often ever since the Jungle Inferno update nerfed this thing into the ground. And like, uh, literally, because it's a parachute. The base jumper is a parachute that can be deployed in the air to slow your descent. Now the obvious thing to do is combine it with an explosive jump for air mobility, but the base jumper can be deployed at any time in the air. A cool trick I use it for is quickly deploying the parachute and undeploying it right after a fall right before you hit the ground to negate fall damage. The base jumper does combine very well with an explosive jump though. You can gain a lot of horizontal and vertical distance from a jump. And when combined with strafing, you can be a hard target to hit in the air. This also means you can come from unexpected places for sneak attacks too. However, you really want to make sure you strafe in the air or else you end up like far from Overwatch, a sitting duck in the air waiting to be headshot by a sniper. I find the base jumper is more useful on Soldier due to it being a replacement for the shotgun, a secondary weapon, while the demo man has it replaced as primary. This means a Soldier is way less likely to get rushed down and killed, while a demo man can struggle in close range encounters with just a sticky bomb launcher to deal damage. However, the base jumper has the same problem as the man treads. It encourages you to blast jump, but you take a lot of damage doing it. This is especially true for Demo due to his lower health pool and taking more damage from jumping. At the end of the day, sacrificing a reliable weapon and a portion of your health isn't worth it over most options most of the time. But the mobility the base jumper grants you is enough to keep it from the higher tiers, so the base jumper goes in B tier. Well here we are at the final entry to this series, so let's make this good. Um, it's got a cool dragon on it, and uh, dragons are cool. F tier. And with that, this series is over, bye. Just kidding, you just got clowned, dude. You just got clowned. The Hula Long Heater is a very divisive weapon in the Heavy Committee. Some claim it's an underrated weapon on the same level as stock, and others say it's the worst primary for heavy. I fall somewhere in the middle. The Huo Long Heater's defining feature is that while spung up you create a circle of flames that surround you, and enemies that walk into the ring are ignited on fire. This ring is mostly intended for countering spies, but any experienced spy knows they can just jump over the ring without getting caught on fire. Instead the ring is great for fighting enemies at point blank range. This is due to its complementary upside of dealing bonus damage to burning players. Keep in mind that the damage bonus is multiplicative with the damage penalty, so it's not 25% over stock. But it's still the most damage a heavy can deal at point blank range outside of using the Brass Beast. This makes the Huo Long Heater a great ambush weapon. Surprise your enemies with fire and bullets and wipe them off the face of the earth. The Huo is also great for holding a payload or point due to the area of denial that the Ring of Fire brings. Igniting an invis spy trying to weave through a group or an enemy trying to contest the point. However, the Huo Long Heater has two downsides that keep its use situational. The first of which being a 10% damage penalty. Now up close you still shred enemies, but at medium to long range the damage penalty becomes a bit more noticeable. However, with a friendly pyre that can send enemies on fire from afar, that problem doesn't really exist. So the heater rewards coordination like that. 
The second downside is a bit less lenient though. While revved, you drain 4 ammo per second. Now this drain only applies while the fire ring is out, so you can still jump and rev without losing ammo. However, this downside can really bite you on open maps or maps that don't have a lot of ammo packs. This means to avoid running out of ammo fast, you either need to A, stick to close range encounters where you can easily pick up ammo boxes off of dead enemies, or B, stick around a dispenser or payload cart, which can also be helpful for spy checking. The Huo Long Heater is a very map dependent unlock, but in the ideal circumstances, it really is on par with the stock in Tomislav. However, the lack of universal use for the heater keeps it from being F tier, so the Dragon Shoot Gun goes in E tier. Now with the tier list complete, it's time for the moment you've all been waiting for. What is the worst weapon in TF2? First, let's recap all our candidates in the S tier. The Bison has a clip penalty, slower firing speed, half the damage, and a slow projectile. But is it the worst, or just god awful? The Gas Passer takes a minute to charge, and does what the Scorch Shot does with one shot. But is its supportive capability enough to keep it from being the worst? The Pompson has all the same problems as the Bison, however its projectile is a tad more consistent and Uber Drain is potentially broken. Is it the worst? The Tribbleman's Shiv is terrible at what the weapon's intended for and a total waste of your melee slot, but it does technically do more damage than the stock. Does it save the weapon? And the Hot Hand deals a pitiful amount of damage on a class with high damaging melee options but the speed boost can make securing a kill easier. Now, without any further ado... It's time for the moment you've been waiting for! The worst weapon in TF2 is not the hot hand, it's the gas passer. Well there you have it folks, the end of this little series is finally over. And now that it's finally over, I just wanted to give a massive thank you to all of you who made it to the end. This series has been months in the making. To get all the gameplay in the background, I've had to play TF2 using all the worst weapons for like a hundred plus hours. And it's cool that my suffering makes for good content that you guys enjoy. I don't like to do the obnoxious YouTuber thing where I beg for likes and subscribers. If you wanted to do that already, you would've. But what I will ask is that if you enjoy my content, to just share it with a friend or something. It goes a long way. Oh man, I don't even know how to end this video. I worked on it for so long. I want to make sure to end it on a good note. <laughs>